What if you could have a career where the opportunities are as vast as our nation, where it's not about mission statements, but a shared mission? At U.S. Customs and Border Protection, we go beyond to protect more than borders, from ship to shore, air to ground, cities to local communities. CBP agents and officers are keeping people safe. Join U.S. Customs and Border Protection and go beyond for something far greater than yourself. Learn more at cbp.gov careers. Have you ever gazed in wonder at the Great Pyramid? Have you marveled at the golden face of Tutankhamun? Or admired the delicate features of Queen Nefertiti? If you have, you'll probably like the History of Egypt podcast. Every week, we explore tales of this ancient culture. The History of Egypt is available wherever you get your podcasting fix. Come, let me introduce you to the world of ancient Egypt. Hi everyone, this is Scott. If you're a fan of the ancient world, please support the Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash the ancient world. Thanks again for listening. Like many rebels down through history, King Ahuni of Bit Adini was mainly defined by his enemies. And I mean that in both senses. That he was defined by who and what he fought against, and how he decided to wage that fight. And in a literal sense. That the only information we have about him comes from the annals of his opponents. Luckily for us, the Neo-Assyrians kept meticulous records, and useful details can sometimes be gleaned from even the blackest propaganda. Up to this point, Ahuni'd done vanishingly little to stand out from his kowtowing Syrian neighbors, aside from not being recorded as visiting Kalhu. But as I noted last episode, he'd likely been far from idle. As best we can tell, Ahunid occupied the 860s BC with prying cities west of the Euphrates out of the hands of Sangara of Carchemish and folding them into the lands of Bit Adini. And in the final years of Ashurnasirpal's reign, he apparently tried something new. You can call it outreach or coercion or whipping up fear. We don't really know what tactics he used. But we do know the eventual result. A broad coalition of Syrian kingdoms committed to mutual defense. If not exactly a rebel alliance, it was at least a start. And evidence points to King Ahuni as being its primary driver. Shalmaneser III clearly had plans to deal with Bit Adini, but his first year in power was consumed by other priorities. His initial campaign was up in the north, where he records putting Kakia, king of Nairiland, to flight, then storming Sagunia, royal city of King Arame of the Armenians. After researching things a bit, I'm going to say that it's possible, but not conclusive, that Arame is the source of the name Armenia. Either way, though King Arame somehow survived, Shalmaneser records killing multitudes of Armenian soldiers and carrying off their booty. He also claims to have built a pyramid of heads in front of their city. So it's safe to say that this Assyrian apple didn't fall too far from the tree. All that happened in Shalmaneser's year one. But year two... That was all about Ahuni. As the king relates, on the 13th of Airu, I left Nineveh, crossed the Tigris, and came to the city of Lalati, ruled by Ahuni of Bit Adini. After destroying the city, Shalmaneser marched on Ahuni's capital of Tilbarsip, where he encountered his first surprise. He records that Ahuni trusted in the size of his army and came out to fight me. 
Now, choosing to fight the Assyrian army is a pretty high-risk move. Just ask the mangled survivors of Luash. So it's worth taking a bit of time to consider his motivations, especially given the lamentable fact that Ahuni left no inscriptions. So what was Ahuni thinking? Well, possibly a few things. First, his kingdom had grown considerably over the past few years, mainly at the expense of Carchemish, so he may have had significant military forces. Second, as he learned from Sangara's experience, sacrificing too much of one's wealth in tribute left one vulnerable to regional rivals, like, you know, Ahuni. Third, Shalmaneser was a pretty young king, So if his nose wasn't bloodied right out of the gate, they'd be staring down years of invasions. Fourth, at this early stage, there was no real sense of Assyrian inevitability. I mean, sure, they were having a pretty good run, but one or two weak or unlucky kings, and they might be back at square one. And lastly, the people who'd had the Assyrians on the ropes for the past couple centuries were Ahuni's people, the Aramaeans. So he knew it was possible to defeat them. So Ahuni lined up against Shalmaneser and decided to try his luck. And while he didn't exactly roll snake eyes, he was pretty soundly defeated though he managed an orderly retreat of his army back inside the walls of Tilbarsip. Shalmaneser decided not to besiege him, but instead to attack a few neighboring cities, killing their soldiers and taking more tribute and plunder. He must have decided that Ahuni could wait till he returned to the region at the campaign's end. So he crossed the Euphrates using goatskin rafts and continued on to phase two. In doing so, just like his father before him, Shalmaneser was crossing a conceptual frontier. All territories east of the Euphrates, all the way to the Zagros Mountains, were considered the land of Assur. They basically reflected Assyrian conquests during their expansionist period of the Late Bronze Age, and included the whole of the former kingdom of Mitanni. This territory was to be fully Assyrianized, developed and directly controlled by the Assyrian king and his governors. Though there were a few exceptions, as we'll discuss with Guzana below. Territories beyond these boundaries were considered under the yoke of Assur. These kingdoms were meant to be dominated by Assyria. I mean, come on, that's just good plain common sense. But their rulers could be left in power as vassal kings. For those who were, their duties were simple. The delivery of annual tribute and complete and total obedience. Interestingly, Shalmaneser didn't cross the Euphrates near Til Barsip or Carchemish, both of which were well-established river crossings, but instead at the kingdom of Kuma. Kuma was an independent Neo-Hittite state located between Carchemish and Malatya, with its capital at classical Samosata. And again, I'll point you to the new maps I've posted. Shalmaneser records that Kuma's ruler, Hattusili, provided a tribute of wealth and supplies. The Assyrian king then records that he approached Ahuni's cities on the other side of the Euphrates. Proof that the king of Bit Adini had been making western inroads. Shalmaneser also records that I overthrew the whole land, turning Ahuni's cities into ruins. From Kuma, Shalmaneser marched due west to the neighboring kingdom of Gurgum and its capital of Maras. As we discussed a while back, Gurgum is where the Hittite royal court may have relocated after abandoning their capital of Hattusas. An inscription from a portal lion recovered from Maras gives a genealogy of the current dynasty, all of whom bear Luwian names. The line began with a figure named Muizi, who likely ruled in the late 10th century BC. 
He was succeeded by his son, Halparun Taya, then his grandson, the current king, Muatali II. Shalmaneser records that Muatali not only surrendered wealth and cattle, but also the hand of his daughter in marriage, which the new Assyrian king accepted, along with a suitable dowry. From Gurgum, it was off to neighboring Samal and its capital of Zinsirli. And since we haven't touched on Samal before, it's a good time for an introduction. According to Bryce, during the last decades of the 10th century BC, a tribal chieftain named Gabar laid the foundations of a small kingdom on the eastern slope of the Amanus Range in southeastern Anatolia. The kingdom became known by the Semitic name Samal, which means north, probably reflecting a northern branch of an Aramean tribe. But since this is northern Syria, it also had a second name. Bitgabari. A later inscription identified two population groups in the kingdom, one likely Aramean, the other Luwian or Neo-Hittite. The inscription states that the Luwian population were apparently treated like dogs. The language of the inscription is also interesting, neither Luwian nor Aramaic, but instead closely tied to Phoenician. We have two good reliefs of the king's successor from just a few decades down the line, which give us a peek at contemporary Syrian royalty. Samal was surrounded by a cluster of states, Gurgum, Patan, Carchemish, and Quay, which rendered it fairly exposed. The current king was named Hayanu, and his son later recorded that the house of my father was in the midst of mighty kings, and each one stretched forth his hand to fight. The capital of Samal, modern Zinsirli, Turkey, was consequently strongly fortified. Roughly circular in shape, its outermost defenses consisted of a double wall punctuated by three gates and surmounted by towers. Among the city's modern remains are four massive basalt lions that guarded the entrance of the fortified citadel, as well as an interesting human-headed sphinx. I've posted some pictures online. Samal controlled a frontier city named Lutibu, which factors into our story. And in case I forget to circle back later, relief panels recovered from a later 8th century BC palace at Lutibu capture an interesting scene. A king and his companion, wearing scale armor, driving a chariot with armored horses beneath a winged sun disc. Just ahead of them, two divine figures attack a powerful lion. Again, pics are posted online. All of which is pretty cool, but the real reason I mention Lutibu is this. When Shalmaneser approached the city from the direction of Gurgum, he encountered his second surprise. The combined armies of four Syrian states. Shalmaneser records that the rulers who faced him were Hayanu of Samal, Supaluliuma II of Patan, Sangara of Carchemish, and last but not least, our old friend Ahuni of Bit Adini. Pulling together a coalition like this implies dedicated diplomatic groundwork. It's possible that by now the diminished Sangara may have been Ahuni's effective vassal, but the other two kings had to be convinced of the need for a coordinated action. We don't know the size of the Allied army, nor of the force led by Shalmaneser. We only know the recorded outcome, that Shalmaneser fought and defeated them, rained destruction upon them, and dyed the mountains like red wool with their blood. But again, neither Ahuni nor the other kings were apparently captured or killed. After making a heroic image of himself, and inscribing his own heroic deeds and brave actions upon it, Shalmaneser crossed the Orontes River and approached Alimush, the stronghold of Supaluliuma, the Patanite. 
I should also mention that we have a surviving statue of Supaluliuma II, and I'll post a picture online. Anyway, Supaluliuma apparently lit the beacons of Gondor, or fired up the bat signal, or something equally quick and effective. Because Shalmaneser next records, facing the armies of Ahuni, Sangara, Hayanu, and Supaluliuma, again, along with four other Syrian kings. These were Hadram of Bitadini, Kate of Quay, Pihirim of Hilaku, and Buranate of Yazbuk. Quay and Hilaku combined to make up classical Cilicia, and, as noted previously, may have included Mycenaean Greek remnants, while Yazbuk was a small Arab tribal state along the Orontes. Again, no numbers, and again, no real handle on how this coalition was somehow cobbled together. All we really know is the outcome, which was yet another victory for Shalmaneser. King Buranate was captured mid-battle, though his fate is mercifully omitted. In the battle's aftermath, the Ad Hoc Alliance experienced its first serious fracture. Bit Adini, Karkemish, Quay, and Halaku remained unbowed, but Samal, Patton, and Bit Agusi offered tribute. While the Syrians retreated to lick their wounds, Shalmaneser devoted himself to a few remaining activities accepting tribute from the kings of the sea coast, extracting timber from the Amanus Mountains, and erecting a few more stelae including one right next to that of his father, Ashurnasirpal. Then, likely satisfied with the year's accomplishments, he made his way back to Assyria. One possible stop along the way was Guzana on the Kabur River, the kingdom founded the previous century by the Aramean king Kapara. As I mentioned earlier, this region was firmly within the so-called land of Assur, but apparently retained a native ruling dynasty. A recovered statue from around this time mentions rulers of Guzana named Sasu Nuri and Hadad Yithil, who styled themselves Lords of the Kabul River. The inscription highlights their parallel roles as kings and Assyrian governors. Even more interesting, the inscription is a bilingual text written in both Aramaic and Akkadian. The winter that followed could have hardly been restful, with the separatist kingdoms raising more levies and bolstering defenses, even as they nervously eyed their neighbors, who were now Assyrian vassals. Quay and Halaku were farther away, and less likely to be immediate targets. Which left little surprise that, when spring finally sprang, Shalmaneser went straight for the throat. I approached Tilbarsip, the fortress of Ahuni of Bit Adini. He trusted in the size of his army and came out to fight me. Shalmaneser boasts of trapping Ahuni in his city which was basically a Assyrianese, for Ahuni successfully defended his city. The Assyrian king then crossed the Euphrates, likely again at Kuma. Once there, he reports storming and capturing six of Ahuni's strong cities west of the Euphrates, and burning 200 more. Even accounting for hyperbole, it's reasonably likely that by this stage, Shalmaneser dismantled the vast majority of Ahuni's western conquests. The Assyrian king then went on to capture and burn the city of Sazabe, which he calls the Fortress of Sengara of Carchemish. Approaching the coast, Shalmaneser received tribute from numerous kings— name-checking both Subaluliuma II of Patan and Hayanu of Samal, who'd been enemies the previous year, as well as Hadram of Bit Agusi and Hattusili of Kuma. The loss of Sazabade also had an effect, because Shalmaneser records collecting significant tribute from Sengara of Karkemish, including the hand of a noblewoman along with her dowry. 
By the time Shalmaneser returned to his homeland, the unbowed contingent of northern Syria was basically down to one man, King Ahuni of bit Adini. In addition to losing all of his allies, he lost an uncounted but substantial number of troops and dozens, if not hundreds, of cities and villages, particularly west of the Euphrates. And when Shalmaneser launched the next year's campaign, both the target and outcome were obvious, though there was a bit of a twist. In 856 BC, as the Assyrian king approached Til Barsip, he records that Ahuni crossed over the Euphrates to save his life and made his way to other lands. The gates of Til Barsip were likely thrown open and Shalmaneser entered the fortified city that had resisted his army several times. But instead of destroying it, he decided to make it Assyrian. As the king records, At the command of my lord Asur, the great lord, I annexed Tilbarsip, along with two nearby cities, as royal cities. I settled Assyrians there and built palaces in them for my royal residence. He renamed Tilbarsip as Kar Shalmaneser, the port of Shalmaneser. With this action, Shalmaneser established a fortified foothold on the eastern bank of the Euphrates, a place to assemble, supply, and launch any future western campaigns. But this particular year, Ahuni aside, there was really no need to cross the Euphrates. As Shalmaneser records, while staying in Kar Shalmaneser, I received the tribute from the kings of the sea coast and the kings along the banks of the Euphrates. So, basically, from all the subservient kings of northern Syria. With his campaign season freed up, Shalmaneser marched northeast to Nairi and Armenian lands. After his defeat a few years past, the Armenian king Aramid founded a new capital at Arzashkun. Shalmaneser records driving him from the city, pursuing him, and fighting a terrible battle in the midst of the mountains. In victory, Shalmaneser reports killing 3,400 of Aramid's soldiers and capturing his camp, collecting a long list of spoils. He then trampled down Arame's land like a wild bull. His cities I turned into wastes, destroying, devastating, and burning Arzashkun, along with nearby cities. By 855, in terms of the West, it was basically all over but the shouting. Not that Ahuni was planning to go down easily. Shalmaneser reports that Ahuni had made Mount Chitamrat, a mountain peak on the bank of the Euphrates, which is like a cloud hanging from the heavens, into his fortress. Assyrian troops ascended the mountain, at which point Ahuni trusted in his widely spread army and came out against me. He drew up a battle line. I hurled the weapons of my lord Asur among them, bringing on their defeat. After fighting a terrible battle in the midst of his city, Shalmaneser obtained his ultimate prize, the capture of King Ahuni. The Assyrian king records that his prisoner, along with his armies, chariots, cavalry, and the lavish and immeasurable wealth of his palace, were carted off to Assur. Ahuni's ultimate fate is mercifully redacted, but it was likely not quick and not even remotely pretty. With Ahuni's capture and the previous annexation of his capital of Tilbarsip, the Aramean kingdom of Bit Adini simply no longer existed. It's worth mentioning that in several inscriptions, Shalmaneser conceded a grudging respect for his erstwhile Aramean nemesis. He recorded that Ahuni since the days of my ancestor kings, had been exercising haughty and forceful rulership, and had boldly and violently acted against my ancestor kings. 
which, considering the source, is actually pretty high praise. It's certainly true that Ahuni's capture effectively ended the resistance, at least in northern Syria. By 854 BC, Shalmaneser perfected a winning, if not quite original, strategy of divide and conquer, defeating, intimidating, and peeling off members from any would-be defensive coalition, then crushing any obstinate holdouts. And since his reign was just starting out, he saw no reason the strategy couldn't take him as far as he wanted to go. For the following year, he planned a campaign that would help him test that assertion. One that would take him to Patton, then Aleppo, then south against a new target, the powerful Neo-Hittite kingdom of Hamath. In doing so, he had little idea he was about to provoke one of the most famous battles of the ancient world. Ancient World Podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network, along with My History Can Beat Up Your Politics, The Explorers Podcast, and other great shows.